Thank you, Lisa. Um, first, you have to know that I don't do this. I have a real job. <laughs> I promise. I don't do this. But, but I figured maybe there's a way to kind of do what I do, because part of my job is kind of to tell my story, tell it in interesting ways, and, and figure out how to connect with important audiences that somehow relate to what we do, or if they don't, maybe they should. So maybe I should do this on occasion, and at the end of the day, maybe it elevates our message, it broadens our message. So I figured that I'm gonna try this, and you guys are my test audience. I actually, I did do this a couple times before. I, I do a lot of activism stuff, and I do a lot of, because I have this compulsive need to just always do a nine million things. And, um, and I'm on eight boards, and I run a public company, and I chair Amphar, and someone said, how do you do it? And I said, drugs, but it's not really how I do it. <laughs> um, but I just have this need to just always do more things and push myself, I guess, as Andy was saying, and challenge myself. And, wait until I die from exhaustion and know I've done as much as I can do. But I am always trying to find a way to do much. And I did, I was asked about, early on in my career, maybe 18 years ago, if I would t tell my story that my activism and why I talk about AIDS and why a guy like me is a, would take a, such a public position on such a sensitive issue. And I said, okay, well, I, I don't know. I can't really, I'm not sure if I should do that. And I can't really speak publicly before large groups of people. And, and um, but I was so impressed with this guy that I figured, you know, he says, just tell your story. You don't have to write a speech. Just stand up for five minutes, tell your story, sit down. It's not a big deal. Okay, I can do this. It's Carnegie Hall. How many people, 4,000 people? Oh, no. So I pre prepared to do this, and I was just, at the time, dating what, who became a woman who became my wife not that much after. And she said, it's not hard what you do. And she came from a political family. Just go up there. What's the guy's name that impressed you, Fred? So t talk about Fred for a minute, and then when you're done extolling his virtues, which you have done to me, then you'll be comfortable to tell your speech, and then you won't be nervous. So I said, I could do that. That's not so hard. So I stood up at Carnegie Hall, right behind all these wonderful acclaimed advocates and spokespeople, and I talked about Fred. And I said, Fred, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Fred. Fred has done such an extraordinary job, inspiring, motivating, bringing us all together. And I'm hearing this noise, because all I could see are lights shining up in my face. And there's this buzz out there, and it seems to be working. And I'm saying, man, Maria's smart. I should marry this woman. And then I, and then I <laughs> did it even more, and it was working even more. And I went on for a couple minutes, and then I did my speech. And it was easy, because it's what I do every day. And I told my story, and I did it with, with genuine comfort and ease and, and passion. And then I sat down, and Maria says, you look great, but his name's not Fred. So. <laughs> That was a true story. <laughs> so years of therapy later. Um, uh, but thank you, Lisa, um, for that introduction. Um, so um, I have been doing this, for, the business is like 20 plus years, years I've been doing this. So I started when I was 11. And, um, <laughs> but, and I really commit myself wholeheartedly to what I do. I love what I do. It's fashion business is the greatest business because no two days are ever the same. I have not done ever in my career one thing that a day was never replicated a day prior. So it's really a wonderful business and, um, and I love doing it. And, and at a certain point, my 20th point, they asked me, they thought I should do a book, so it was a good marketing opportunity to tell the companies and the businesses' stories, so I did that, and which is when I actually started speaking a little bit, because when you do books, you're supposed to burden people even more, and um, <laughs> hey, you're asking them to read your story, now you gotta hit, they gotta listen to it too. Um, so I went around and I did that a little bit, and the book, by the way, you should know, had 11 and a half chapters, and people said, why? And I said, well, because you don't really want to end a book in chapter 11. So I, a business book in chapter 11. <laughs> Idiot. So um, that was the last time I spoke. And then, and then today. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what I do. I'm going to tell you how I got here um, in this negative 
two degrees Fahrenheit. It was the Fahrenheit, it became very clear, centigrade Fahrenheit was explained to me very clearly in the car right over here. <laughs> now I have to be here, um, but so much for a warm reception. So I got off the plane to negative two, <laughs> negative two degrees. And um, so, and then I'm gonna tell you my credentials and you can choose the degree you ch that you want to to discount what I have to tell you when you have a sense of the whole perspective. But I, I was on my way to law school and um, I had graduated from college. I was on my way to law school. My family had a little shoe business and, and I joined my father and he had a factory and I had really struggled with the concept of, work, of having a factory because you're really limited and confound, confined to what you can do every day. Your factory can only make so much and there, there was a very clear ceiling and best case you could make a little bit, worst case you lose everything. So it was something I really struggled with and so then we, the concept of importing a, an import business, which in theory, everything is variable. You do a lot of business, you make a lot. You do a little, you make less, if you can really structure a business model like that. So the, the business was candies, candy shoes, and it was, we really kind of nailed it and we sold millions of pairs of shoes. People accused us of crippling half a generation of Americans. And, um, <laughs> and I, don't, I don't ever, um, it not respond to that without my lawyer, but we sold a lot of <laughs> shoes in a short period of time. And then in 1982, I, I needed to do, it, to do something that was a little bit more personal, and, um, and I started my own business. Um, because I knew if I didn't then, I never would, and, and, and I loved working with my father, but he had his way, and it wasn't necessarily mine, and, and it wasn't incumbent upon him to change, so I figured that I should do that. And, and I was young and stupid enough at the time and I figured that I should do it. So I did and, and I had various dilemmas. One, I didn't have a lot of money because I was too proud to ask, or to ask for any when I left the business. So I started the business in my apartment. I needed the name of the company fast because I knew in America, and I don't know if it's that much different here in Canada, but the most, I think it's 60 to 70% of startup companies go out of business their first year in business because they either underestimate the time it takes to generate return on cash or, um, or they just um, don't have enough income, don't, enough working capital to begin with. So I knew I had to move quickly and I had to make, and I found I was gonna make cool lady shoes, that's what I was gonna do. And I found a factory that was gonna make them for me because um, I knew that I needed to get credit and I had a better chance of getting credit from an Italian shoe factory that needed business than from an American bank that didn't. So set that guy up and now I needed a name of the company because I had to make business cards and stationery and shoe boxes and labels and I had to apply for a trade show. And I couldn't take the chance of making up a name and then finding out the trademark process months and months later through Washington and Delaware that the name wasn't, it was in questionably um, that I could use it. So that it was in coverage. So I used my own name because you can almost always get your own name um, approved as long as you're a real person and it made my mother happy. So I called the company <laughs> Kenneth Cole Inc. Rant Italy designed a line of cool lady shoes and I came back and now I had to figure out how to, how to sell them. And the, the shoe industry in the United States, at the time there were two ways you did that. One, there was a, um, a, a coliseum where you just, uh, you, you were one of thousands of companies and you put your shoes out there and bars walked around. Another way was there was the Hilton Hotel and there was 11, um, and there was uh, 1,100 companies, 30 company, 30 floors, 30 plus companies per floor, and the buyers would walk every single floor, look at all your, your see what you had to show, and everybody had the same shoes, they had different labels, and and then, or if you had a lot of resources, a lot of money, you could take a big fancy showroom within a two block radius of the Hilton Hotel. So clearly, I neither had the resources to do the latter, nor the um, the comfort level to be one of 1,100 companies when I'm trying to basically make my life story. I'm gonna make my life, this is it. I, this is everything I've saved. This is gonna be who I am. I put my name on the damn thing. And um, so I had this great idea and I called a friend of mine in the trucking business. I said, if I could figure out how to park one of your 40 foot trailers on the corner of 6th Avenue and 56th Street in New York, right across from the Hilton Hotel, right in front of one of those big fancy buildings that have all these fancy showrooms, Will you lend it to me? And he said, sure, idiot. 
This is New York. You can't park a damn bicycle for 10 minutes, let alone a truck for four days. Will you lend it to me? If I can get a picture, I'll lend it to you. Okay, so I called the mayor's office, Mayor Koch at the time. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, how does one get permission to park a 40-foot trail on the corner of 6th Avenue and 57th Street on December 2nd, 1982? And there was a silence, and then the answer was, sorry, son, they don't. This is New York. You get permission only under two circumstances. One is if you are a utility company servicing our streets, AT&T, Con Ed, or if you are a production company shooting a full-length motion picture, because we're going through an I Love New York campaign, apparently, in the early 80s. I found that out on a phone call. So I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor, hung up the phone. That afternoon, I went to a stationery store, changed the name of the company from Kenneth Gold, Inc. to Kenneth Gold Productions, Inc. Fi <laughs> Cost me $14. And then I <laughs> filed for a permit the following morning with the mayor's office for permission to shoot a full-length motion picture called The Birth of a Shoe Company. I opened for December 2nd with two New York policemen um, as my doorman, compliments of Mayor Koch, for four days. I had Klieg lights, I had stanchions, and I had a director. Sometimes it was filming his camera, sometimes it wasn't. And I saw every buyer in New York, and I made them, the longer I made them wait, the more they bought when they came in. And we sold 40,000 pairs of shoes in two and a half days. And that's a true story. The company today is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, simple as KCP, the chemical Productions. So now I had a business, and now what are you, how are you gonna do with it? So I needed to grow the business consistent with my compulsiveness and my need to just always do new things. But the problem is I was selling cool shoes to cool people, to ladies, cool ladies. Now, that's a finite number of people almost by definition, because, and the minute you sell someone who's not cool, you're not cool. So, and if you sell it in a place that's not cool, you're less cool. So, and you sell it at a price that's not cool, you're not cool. So this is a real problem. So I'm kind of figuring out, now how am I gonna grow this damn thing if there's only a few of those people out there that I can sell it to? So I figured, well, I'll sell their mail Companions, that's easy enough. Maybe I'm one of them, or I certainly aspire to be. So I will make men's shoes and then women's shoes. Okay, now I'm kind of going. But now our competitors, for the most part, are selling more shoes to more people. Now I kind of have a problem with that because then I kind of um, compromise that which brought me to the party. So, and I knew I needed to not do that. And um, I couldn't source differently. I couldn't make less than cool shoes because then the brand would lose what it was up until that point. So I decided instead to find more things to sell to the same cool people. So that was the goal over the years. And the business grew and grew and grew, and, and, um, and then it was accessories, and then it was, so we're making all these accessories, and these wonderful editors would come in and take pictures of, that edit, of all this product that meant the world to us. And, and then the picture would come out in the magazine, and the model would be this big, and the shoe would be this big. And we realized that this isn't fair. This is a, there's a bigger canvas here. So, and it was clothing. And there was, at the same time, there was this, um, there was this, uh, a lot going on in the United States. And men, were, there was this big change in the way everybody was dressing in the early 90s. And um, there was something came, came along, it was called Casual Friday. I don't know if you had that here. But all the, I think it was designed by, it was created by retailers. And, Every man in the world was told, nothing you own works anymore, guys. Um, because every guy owned the same stuff. We had suits, and they were navy, and the shirts were white, and the ties were red, and we had one pair of black, one pair of brown shoes, and then we had torn jeans, t-shirts, and sneakers. Every guy's closet in Canada and America, North America, was the same. And then all of a sudden, corporate America comes along and says, sorry, none of it works anymore. The casual's too casual, too torn, too sloppy. Dresses too uniform. You look like a goddamn um, uh, soldier. And then if we were lucky enough and got to go to fancy fairs at night, we were damn, we were penguins. We all wore the same costume to, to the same costume party because we were all wear the same tuxedos and the same tie. So all of a sudden, none of that doesn't works anymore. So we come along. We say, you know, we'll solve America's problem because we are very much concerned about the community and people's well-being. And so 
That was the goal. And, and then, men, you know, and then, but getting dressed was really hard, and women were struggling with what to wear. It was taking them hours to get dressed in the morning. And so we figured, you know what, there's a way to solve that. And I can't take credit for it, but I certainly got on the bandwagon. And it was called black. <sighs> now, everything worked. Women looked slimmer, looked better. They could wear the same thing at night as they were during the day, and they could wear it this season, they could wear it next season. And, and if for some reason you're at work and someone you know dies, you don't have to go home and change. It was so, <laughs> it was so practical. So we grew this business with a very real compassion for our audience from the very beginning to the very end. Today we have 35 licensees, 155 stores, 23 countries, $1.7 billion in sales. So, So that's, that's the business story. Now, um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about kind of some of the non-business stuff that uh, kind of behind all that. And, you know, I was listening before um, to what Andy was saying, and, you know, one of, you can't re, I never really had any doubts when I did this. I knew I needed to make it work. And, and people came up to me afterwards and said, well, what would you have done if it didn't work? You know, you kind of walked away in a kind of a funny way from the family business, and, and, and you really put yourself out there. If it didn't work, what you've done? And I said, you know what? At the risk of sounding arrogant and or cocky, I said, you know what? It was never a thought, and it wasn't. I just never contemplated the concept that it didn't work. But what I don't tell people, what I didn't tell people, is that I didn't know what it was. And I knew I'd figure it out. I knew that every day, I didn't know what the hell I'd be doing here today in Ottawa, of all places. And I didn't know what I'd be. <laughs> and I sure as hell didn't know what I'd be doing in the, you know, the, for the last 20 years. But I knew I'd figure it out. And I knew somehow I'd make it make sense. And I knew I'd be open to the changing realities, the socio-political whatever circumstances. And I'd find a way to make it make sense and make it the right thing. So, and that's what I've tried to do. So there was no real formula. Every day I go to work and I take inventory. And I try to get a sense of who's a community, who's a customer, what's on their mind, what's important, and what's inspiring them today. And in some ways, you know, it's the proverbial put yourself in their shoes and with the hope they'll put themselves in yours, but it's not always <laughs> there. Um, but I'm lucky because I'm the customer. So, and, and yet we're not, as business people, we're not always that lucky. So I've had the fortune of kind of being able to kind of reflect a little bit and say what inspires me and what makes me feel how, what, and where. The fashion business is an extraordinary business model. And, um, and I think it's a great business model for all businesses today because it's essentially, it's about change and, it's, and it, fashion is almost means of the moment. And of the moment by definition means not of the other moment. And it means you've got to apply all of your emotional and financial and corporate resources to what is important today. And it's counterintuitive, and it's not what we're trained to do. It's not what you're taught in business school. It's not often what you're taught in life. It's not about amortizing an investment today over as long a period of time as possible. It's about doing what's appropriate at the time. And it's hard, and it's, it's contrary, again, to what we're often taught. And, um, and fashion is a wonderful thing because it's about, it's not about what's there, it's about, often it's about what's not. And so you go out into the world and you kind of want to see where people are, what's on their minds, what's, what's inspiring them. And, and, and it, again, it's not what you see, it's what you don't see, and, which is a wonderful thing. As children, we're taught to draw within the lines. And, um, but in life, you often realize that the greatest success is outside those lines. And to the degree we can learn that, to the degree we can kind of inspire ourselves and, and our children to, to realize that I think it's a wonderful gift. And, and it's the path less traveled. So it's reinventing ourselves every damn day. And it is hard because you've got so much invested in yesterday's emotions and, and commitments. So it's what I tried to do. And it's about change. And, um, and I do everything I can to build my corporate culture so that it embraces change, it inspires change, it responds to change. What are we gonna do on Monday 
is it the same thing that we did last Monday just because it's what we did last Monday or is it still what we need to do on Monday? That is the very difficult question. Business is not what it was. The value equation isn't what it was. And what are we offering? What are we asking people to, to um, accept from us? Nobody needs what we sell. There isn't a person in Canada or the United States that needs another pair of shoes or black shoes in particular or a tie or a white shirt. We have to make you think you do and we have to make you feel glad you thought that way and make you think it again. And that, <laughs> but we, but it's sobering and, we, and, and, and it's, you have to be realistic to who you are and, and, uh, and what you do and you can't be delusive because we so often are.